Utah, the unceded ancestral territory of the Goshoot, Ute, um, Eastern Shoshone and Paiute tribes. And we're using the technology of Zoom to connect with our guests. And they are headquartered in San Jose, California on the unceded territory of the Ohlone peoples. We also acknowledge that we are privileged to be where we are in the prosperity of the United States in significant part due to the labor of enslaved persons. And beyond these acknowledgements, I'm here today to invite you to learn more. Um, we are convening during Black History Month and um, Carter G. Woodson is credited with founding what we now know as Black History Month. He was the founder of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History in 1915. And in 1926, after recognizing that his own history studies at Harvard and at the University of Chicago were incomplete, um, he thought it would be important to have a National Negro History Week, coinciding with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln that later was acknowledged in 1776, the year of the US Bicentennial by President Gerald Ford as a national recognition of Black History Month. Um, so we're coming to you in celebration of Black History Month and we'll spend some time with our speaker talking about um, the importance of Black history. So I am Erica George, a Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law and Director of the Tanner Humanities Center. The Tanner Humanities Center promotes humanities exploration and engagement through three programs. We do academic research, we do educational enrichment, and we do public outreach, which is um, our program today. And today we are joined by Professor Martha Jones. She will talk to us about Black Americans on the borders of belonging. Um, I wanna spend some time introducing you to Professor Jones. Um, she is esteemed illustrious and has done an incredible amount of work. I've relied on her research as I prepare and learn to talk about voting rights and to give talks here in Utah. Um, so she really speaks universally and specifically to the national questions that we've been confronting. Professor Martha Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor of History and a professor of, of history at the SF, SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Significantly, she is a history professor of American law and American culture. And her work has examined Black Americans and how we've shaped the story of American democracy. Um, Professor Jones is author most recently of Vanguard, <laughs> How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All in 2020. This book was selected one of Time's 100 best must read books for 2020. Her 2018 book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in the Antebellum of America in 2018 was the winner of several prizes, including the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award for Best Book in Civil Rights History, the American Historical Society Association Littleton Griswold Prize for Best Book in American Legal History, the American Society for Legal History John Philip Reed Book Award for the best book in Anglo-American legal history and the Baltimore City Historical Association Scholars Honor for 2020. Professor Jones is also author of Bound Up All Together, The Woman Question in African-American Public Culture mm -hmm. in 1830 to, 20, to 1900. Um, this is one of my favorites as well. And um, significantly, she's a public historian. This means that she writes for broad, broader audiences. Um, I recently read an op-ed that she placed in the Washington Post, but she's also written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, USA Today, um, People Magazine, Time, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, she's also an exhibit curator. She has been a consultant for museums and film and video productions. Um, she's worked with the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, as well as the PBS American Experience, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Netflix, and even globally um, with art in France. She holds her PhD from Columbia University in history. She's a graduate of CUNY, um, City University of New York Law School, and she was a real live lawyer in a former life, public interest litigator, so special after my heart as a human rights lawyer initially. Um, she has done work in New York City and on the future of the city um, at New York University, at Columbia University in New York. Um, I know that's a lot, there is even more, 
but she holds um, board seats with the Society of American Historians, the National Women's History Museum, and the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Um, I have been delighted that we could secure her. This is something we've been working on for a while. Um, it's truly a pleasure to have Professor Jones with us. We will also be joined by Professor Michelle McKinley, who I'll announce and introduce later in the program. But rather than delay further, um, because I know you're here to hear her, I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Jones to share with us um, some of her work and to speak about belonging. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jones. Well, thank you very much um, to you, Professor George, um, and to everyone there um, at the Tanner Humanities Center for uh, bringing us together, um, especially um, with our friends um, at the University of Oregon. Um, it's really, um, you know, this has been such a challenging time for us um, when it comes to matters of coming together and uh, sustaining the kinds of conversations that are so important to our work and, and to our communities. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for the extraordinary effort you all have done to link us together um, uh, as principals, but um, thanks to everybody who's joined us um, wherever you are. We hope you are safe. We hope you have heat um, and more. Um, it is a very difficult moment yet again for us collectively. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, um, just a few minutes before, um, I really am eager to hear your questions and thoughts and have some conversation. Um, but I did suggest that um, one way to frame uh, the work that I do is through a phrase that I have borrowed from our colleague, um, history and law professor at the University of Minnesota, Barbara Welke, um, this notion of um, borders of belonging um, and the um, through line that runs um, through um, the history of the Americas, including the history of the United States, um, questions about um, who is in and who is out, um, who is belongs, who's excluded. Um, I was very grateful, Professor George, for your uh, land acknowledgement, um, which is a reminder that um, for many of us, our time here in the Americas is um, born out of the problem um, and the dilemmas about um, borders and belonging, um, colonialism, enslavement, and more as um, chapters um, in that broader story. Um, I began very much as someone who, uh, my work very much as someone um, who wanted to think about the relationship of Black Americans to American democracy. Um, my early forays, as you suggested, um, were in African American women's history. Um, and um, in that work, um, I was really um, wrestling with, um, I think, the ways in which um, Black women in early America um, face an extraordinary series of hurdles, yes, but also um, face a series of questions and um, a series of debates about that go to the very heart of who, what this country is, um, who it is for, um, and by what means um, we come to claim ourselves to be Americans. We come to claim ourselves as having a set of not only inalienable but unassailable um, claims upon the nation. Um, it's a long story, but for me, it very much begins. And it turns out um, I never quite leave um, African-American women who, um, by the time I'm writing um, the book Vanguard, are um, teaching me the ways in which um, Black women um, were hardly um, latecomers or interlopers um, or um, unexpected uh, players in the scenes of American democracy, that, but that really from the inception of this nation, um, African-American women are in their own sense, founders of this country, um, founders who define for us um, a set of ideals. Yes, we have founding ideals that emanate from hallowed documents like the Declaration and the Constitution. Um, and at the same time, black women, um, in their memoirs, 
um, in their diaries, in their letters, um, in their speeches, are speaking to yet other ideals. And here specifically, um, what they taught me was that um, when we invoke principles like feminism or anti-racism in the 21st century, um, we are hardly inventing new ideals or new standards or new principles um, for this country. But in fact, black women um, had been at work um, creating those sorts of ideals, crafting them into the political theory, promoting them in the rough and tumble of American politics, bequeathing them to us in the 21st century. Um, my students who are wonderful, I have to say, are also guilty um, of um, imagining that they um, are the generation that um, invented the notion of say intersectionality um, as an analytic frame. Well, bravo for them, um, but it turns out that there's a longer history. Of course, um, many of us have read and learned from the work of um, figures like Patricia Hill Collins and Kimberly Crenshaw um, these remarkable scholars who um, really put pen to paper um, in the late 20th century to um, insert intersectionality um, firmly into academic discourse. Um, but it turns out that we can turn the clock all the way back to the beginnings of the 19th century, um, the first decades of that century and discover black women already at work in crafting that political philosophy. Um, so, um, at the same time, um, I think what has been um, remarkable um, about my experience with this work is that um, its reach, its lessons, um, its insights um, speak to um, communities that extend far beyond um, those that are generated out of the black, histor the black historical figures about whom I write, which is to say, um, perhaps um, in this setting, it's not too trite to say that black history is American history. Um, and in that sense, um, I think some of the most moving um, aspects of this journey um, have been when, for example, when I published in 2018, a book about the history of citizenship and in particular, the role that black Americans played in promoting and instantiating birthright citizenship into the US constitution um, that my audiences included um, immigrant Americans, um, folks who in the 21st century are on the front lines of these struggles over belonging and um, came to um, learn and came to extract lessons from the experiences um, from the activism, from the visions that Black Americans um, had set in place a very long time ago, um, it turned out that those had uh, deep relevance for um, immigrant Americans, particularly Latinx Amer uh, immigrants in the United States in the 21st century. Um, and so this capacity of, of Black history um, to speak to um, many kinds of Americans um, is um, a, uh, um, an unexpected but um, powerful facet of what um, I hope this work has been able um, to do. Um, my most recent book, as you know, is about the history of um, African-American women's struggles around voting rights in the United States. And um, anyone who thinks I was um, so, <laughs> so, so insightful that I could understand where we would be um, in the fall of 2021 overestimates my capacity for clairvoyance. Um, I knew we were going to be in an anniversary year that would be marking 100 years since the 19th um, Amendment and um, the constitutionalization of women's votes in this country, uh, but I could not have understood the um, extraordinary contours of a contest that stretched, as we all know, all the way into January of 2021, and um, a contest in which at every level of American politics, um, Black women were front and center and consequential. Um, so once again, it turns out um, that Black history turns out to be extraordinarily instructive um, in our own time. And while um, 
I am someone um, who is um, admiring of the capacity of, of the work we do about the Black past to speak to the present. I think there is also a lamentful undertone to that kind of acknowledgement. And it is that indeed so many of the questions, so many of the challenges, so many of the concerns, so many of the principles that Black Americans, um, the folks about whom I write um, many, many years ago, what they have put on the table for this country remains unfinished business. And this is why um, Black history um, is at the center, not only of our thinking about the past, but our navigation of a very troubled present, um, because we continue um, to do historical work and a great deal more um, in a world um, that is still grappling vividly with the question about um, the, the degree to which Black Americans belong um, and if they belong um, by what terms. And um, that may indeed make our work profoundly relevant, but it also um, makes it an incredibly um, sober and humbling undertaking um, because it is so intertwined um, with our present. I, we, are, we are gathering here in um, mid-February of 2021 um, on a day in which the um, new uh, life expectancy um, statistics were released in the United States, um, statistics that are beginning to take account of the disproportionate effect of um, COVID-19 on black and brown Americans. Um, and it is a reminder um, that that um, chilling factoid um, like so many other facts of black life in the 21st century um, has a long um, and troubled history um, that we um, must understand in order to not only appreciate how we got here, but to begin to chart a way um, forward. So um, maybe I'll stop there if that's okay and say um, thank you very much for um, the chance to be in conversation and and for the open-endedness of this um, this getting together it's it's really a treat so thank you um, so much again professor George and uh, I look forward to the conversation well thank you um, I'd actually like to take a moment to thank the people who've made this conversation possible for us um, oh the OC Tanner Foundation the diversity equity inclusion office at the University of Utah Utah's um, Salt Lake City's Zoo Arts and Parks Program, ZAP. Mm -hmm. And we also have the cooperation of partners, including the College of Humanities, the Black Cultural Center here on campus, the Center for the Study of Women at the University of Oregon, um, not here on campus, and we'll be including them in the conversation soon. And I also wanted to acknowledge that this, um, your book, <laughs> um, Vanguard, has been selected by the Dean of the Law School as this month's Dean's Diversity Book Selection. So thank you for that. Um, I'm struck by, and thank you for your comments about the nature of the instructive capacity of looking at Black history in this country. And um, we've recently had some challenges here in Utah. We've had a school um, that decided it would be okay to opt out of Black History Month. And there were a number of parents, it's not been disclosed how many or why, um, who elected to have their children sit out a discussion of Black history. Um, some, and somewhat related, though in a different state, in a different context, I understand that um, your book recently um, met with resistance and a Louisiana Public Library banned a conversation about the topic. Um, so these are difficult and challenging issues to talk about and address, but I wanted to invite you to perhaps help us better understand um, the capacity to speak to different kinds of people. I'm noticing your fabulous background behind you and I see that 400 souls is on your shelf, which is on my reading list. Um, I guess this is also still tied to the notion of doing the work of doing history and the work history does. Um, this is perhaps more of a comment than a question, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on the Louisiana Utah situation, um, the emerging popularity of scholars like Professor Ibram Kendi and the collective works that are being brought together and being brought to the public. Yeah. Um, 
my way of um, thinking about this starts um, with a question that I have remarkably for me been asked many, many times in the last six months um, from young people, from elders, um, from journalists um, and uh, colleagues. And it goes something like, um, why didn't I learn this in school? Why didn't I learn this in school? Or from young people more pointedly, um, why did you keep this from us for so long? So here in those questions, um, I myself hear a number of imperatives that I think inform and undergird our work. Um, one version of it is, um, you know, there's always much more to do um, than the production of academic insights um, that in order for those insights um, to make their way into classrooms, make their way into book groups, make their ways into public library conversations and more, um, we have to be agents of that um, translation and transmittal of knowledge. Um, we cannot sit back and simply wait for folks to finally pick up our books and um, incorporate them, um, that we have to be, um, you know, in the best sense, proselytizers and, and, and bring the good word and, and history is part of the good word. And I think of um, my colleague and friend, Ibram Kendi as someone who um, has embraced that um, uh, principle along with his co-editor of 400 Souls, um, Keisha Blaine, um, you know, they brought together 90 of us um, to write essays and um, to model a different way of writing history, um, but also another way of bringing history um, to the places it needs to go um, and where people are really pining for it. But the other side of that coin, um, and I think your experience in Utah with Black History Month, my experience in Louisiana with the a live public library's um, refusal to host a conversation about Vanguard um, and the subject of voting rights. Those kinds of moments um, were a reminder to me um, that part of the reason we haven't learned these things in school is that people indeed have kept them from us and have been deliberate about that. And we should make no mistake about it in the 21st century um, that um, whether it is public programming um, or it is a public school a curriculum or more, um, we are um, find ourselves in a, um, a battle over um, what histories will be taught, by what terms, by whom, and more. Um, and as um, historians, as teachers of history, and more curators, librarians, um, I have very few words of comfort um, for colleagues in this historical moment. Um, I don't think we should be naive about the challenges in front of us, but I have also been very moved um, in my own dust up over the challenge to my book and the ideas in it um, have made um, some new allies in the project of history, especially um, through um, the major library associations um, and my professional organizations like the Association of American Historians, the Organization of American Historians and the American Historical Association. These are organizations that are in the trenches every day um, fighting that good fight. And um, I consider myself very fortunate to be um, in the trenches with these folks as we will continue, I think, to battle over um, whose history, when and where and how it gets told. Well, thank you for staying on the vanguard of this. Um, my second question actually 
does want to pick up um, a part of the vanguard. Um, as you mentioned, we studied and what well, we celebrated, and we do study the 19th Amendment. Um, Utah had a wonderful program on women's history. You know, Utah is one of the, well, the first to vote is our tagline. And our mm -hmm. colleagues um, partnered with us and we had a, some fantastic programming. I'm actually really, very proud of it. And I think some of them are with us here today. Mm -hmm. um, you start your first chapter of the book with a quote um, from the editors of the Freedom Journal. It says, a woman who would attempt to thunder her tongue would not find her eloquence increase her domestic happiness. A man in furious passion is terrible to his enemies, but a woman in a passion is disgusting to her friends. She loses all the respect due to her sex, and she has not masculine strength or courage to enforce any other kind of respect. Um, this is in the context of women awakening, Black women awakening, to demand a space to participate in politics. Um, so you did say you didn't have a crystal ball. You didn't see um, Vice President Harris coming. But we actually had um, Senator Kamala Harris here in October for the first vice presidential debate featuring a Black woman or a woman of African-American and um, South Asian-American descent. So um, my question for you then, or an invitation to further comment, is can you unpack that power dynamic, gender, race dynamic that that quote encapsulates, I think, so beautifully? Sure. Um, uh, you know, um, Black women 200 years ago come to American politics um, very much out of a sense of urgency, a sense of um, acute need um, and a growing sense of their own talents and capacities and force. Um, and in some ways, I think um, we haven't changed very much over 200 years. Um, when I think about uh, now Vice President Harris, um, one of the things I know about her professional life is that it has been a life of public service um, and um, not always in um, the most refined of spaces. Um, those years as a local prosecutor um, in Oakland, California, um, I know those courthouses um, and I know what kind of work life that is. And that is not um, the high glamour of American politics, that is public service. Um, so I think that, um, and in a sense of um, using one's talents and capacities to um, address um, and to serve um, a, a human, a set of human needs um, that are not reducible to the interests of black women, though they certainly are um, speaking in part to them. Um, so I, for one, see um, Senator Harris, you now Vice President Harris, I keep doing that, I've got to get used to it, right? Vice President Harris, um, as um, someone who is very much an individual, um, very much a woman of the 21st century in American politics, but as she has told us herself, someone who stands upon the shoulders of um, generations of Black women who have come before her. And those of you who tuned in for her uh, acceptance speech, um, when she uh, accepted the nomination um, to run alongside uh, President Biden in August of 2020, um, she spoke about the women on whose shoulders she stood. And when she did so, she reached back all the way to the 19th century. Um, and um, I couldn't agree with her more um, from the outside, um, but to hear her own testimony um, about how she understands how um, arriving um, where she has um, landed in American politics um, to me was a real affirmation of those 
early 19th century women who begin to ask questions, to challenge barriers, and to carve out their own role in American politics. I have one last question before I turn over to our guest. And um, among the many things you do, you do spend time with the arts, not just history and the humanities. You are a consultant to the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. You've been doing more with Netflix and popular cultural forms. I'm, I'm proud to announce that here in Utah, you can still see the University of Utah's Utah Museum of Fine Arts has the Black Refractions exhibit on. This is a guest mm -hmm. Um, curated exhibit that's traveling from the Studio Museum of Harlem. We're also very proud to have that here. Um, so follow the Tanner Humanities Center and we can share more information about that. But I thought it was just really great to have you here now to perhaps talk about why it's important to also appreciate Black art and have it represented um, even in a state that has a minuscule percentage of perhaps of an African and African descendant population. Why is it that you're now choosing to do work with art and artists? Sure. Um, you know, I consider um, many black artists to be um, fellow travelers um, with those of us who are um, historian interpreters and historian storytellers. Um, my first kind of um, moment in making that connection happened my very first semester in graduate school. My very first paper was about Jacob Lawrence. I had just seen Lawrence's migration series, which was reunited in the 1990s at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And this is a 60 panel series, half of which lives in the Phillips collection in Washington and half of which lives at MoMA and they were reunited. And I think the paper title was something like everything I learned about the great migration I learned from Jacob Lawrence. Um, but it really was a moment where I appreciated that Lawrence not only had a kind of um, visual vocabulary um, at his disposal that I did not and will never have. Um, he had an insight into the migration experience um, that was distinct from the one I might pull from the archives. And maybe as important as anything else, um, there were hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of people streaming through the galleries of the Museum of Modern Art to imbibe Lawrence's interpretation of this extraordinary sea change experience for Black Americans. And I realized no matter how many books or articles I wrote, most people, many more people would learn um, about and of the Great Migration through Lawrence's interpretation. So what to do? Well, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, and, and so um, I, I um, I hardly have the talent uh, and nor do I have the formal training um, to make me a, a curator or an art historian in those terms. Um, but I am someone who has invested um, in that kind of learning and understanding and have been very fortunate to have um, among my partners in my work life, um, curators, um, artists, um, art historians, um, and more filmmakers and more um, who give me an opportunity um, to speak to those um, much broader audiences and to bring my message about history um, into those venues. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, frankly, uh, I think um, in, in the kind of work I do, um, understandably and importantly, um, there's a great deal um, in what I write that is that is grave, that is sobering, um, uh, that that burdens the heart and the soul. Um, so I also spend times in museums because um, they are places of beauty um, and a reminder, right, of, of all that. And so I hope for folks who make it to um, the museum there and Black Refractions, um, there is also an opportunity um, just to immerse yourself in, um, in this very um, special 
uh, manifestation of, of, of Black beauty. I, I think that's a really important part of the story. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And truly, thank you for the work that you do and um, doing what you need to do to continue to do it. And we'll continue to read it. Um, people are asking how they can get your book. We'll make sure that they know that. But um, did you? I would say um, Vanguard. My latest, latest book, Vanguard, is available wherever you wherever you wonderfully buy your own books. Um, please support your independent booksellers. Um, they have been so challenged um, by the uh, pandemic conditions. Um, patronize your public library, um, where um, wonderful librarians are so eager to bring Vanguard, but so much else to us. Um, so um, I, I thank you very much for that. Um, so Tanner Humanity Center's partner is the local bookstore, The King's English. So wonderful. Um, please do visit their website or visit ours for more information. So it is now my pleasure to introduce another illustrious scholar, um, Michelle McKinley. She is the Bernard B. Kilks Professor at the University of Oregon Law School, and she is also the director of the University of Oregon Center for the Study of Women in Society. She has published widely on public international law, Latin American legal history, and the law of slavery. We also had Michelle here live and in person when her book, book came out. Well, I can't claim that. It was actually the College of Humanities History Department um, to whom we are grateful for recognizing how fabulous her book, Fractional Freedom, Slavery, Intimacy, and the Legal Mobilization in Colon Colonial Lima, um, 1600 to 1700. So she joined our faculty to speak about that book, um, I guess maybe a couple of years ago now, and she's back with us to be in conversation with Professor Jones. Um, she is the recipient of the research of several research fellowships. I'll mention the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, um, and also the Newberry Library. Um, I am just going to turn over to Michelle. She is also my dear friend and classmate from Harvard Law School. Yeah. Um, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Martha, um, for this opportunity. I must say, I, I'll, I'll take just two seconds to do two things. One is that uh, the Center for the Study of Women in Society has bought um, a dozen of Martha's books. And so uh, we are making those available. Um, we have prioritized K through 12 uh, teachers who at this point would like to, um, to procure the book and use it in, um, in their curriculum and uh, we anticipate rolling out uh, a teaching curriculum around this uh, book as well. But for those who would like to um, get the book, uh, it is available through us and you just have to um, contact me for the, the Oregon based folks. The other thing is, I, you know, I'm, I have to step back and I do have to say that um, when Erica and I first started talking about this, this uh, inviting um, Martha, and, you know, and, and and we realized that this was the before and, you know, it was not Zoom and this, that, the other, but um, I had been approached by a lot of, uh, of colleagues within our center to talk about the 19th Amendment. And I had, um, I, I had some hesitation. I had some hesitation because I just had um, a kind of a visceral, uninformed, reaction to kind of white women's celebration of this uh, of, uh, of this achievement. And I also had a, a, a real lingering sense of, you know, felon disenfranchisement, um, the, the, the ways in which, you know, uh, the black vote was, was so suppressed and continued to be uh, so suppressed. And I, I, and I just knew that there was more to the story. And I had just finished uh, birthright citizenship. So um, I didn't kind of know what Martha was working on. Um, and then I went to a, a conference of the Western uh, Association of Women Historians where Martha just told this wonderful story about, and I really, really want you to tell that story about this, this the, the, the woman, uh, the, the young woman with the parasol, you know, mm -hmm. in that. So, so within Vanguard, um, 
you know, you really do see the nitty gritty of what it is to organize in a white supremacist state, what it is to think through um, femininity, respectability, um, activism in, 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 in this context. But what Martha does so beautifully in this is to also trace, you know, where do, do, do women sit in public transportation? Are they gonna be in the smoking car? Are they gonna be with men? You know, and so it struck me as a, a very resonant with you know, uh, Sandra Bland and the ways in which um, black women were still very, very suspect and very vulnerable in that uh, space of transportation. And uh, there are certain chapters, of course, in which Martha talks about just the, the, the mileage, you know, just like planning through, you know, how are you going to get from Cincinnati to Pittsburgh? And, you know, what are the, what are the, so, so th there's an understory there that I really, really appreciated. And it comes through, it comes out through the book. Um, the, but but one of so so that was a very long um, sprawling. Uh, <laughs> but but what I'm hoping is that we'll tell the parasol story. But you know, um, so when we talked about this, you know, you you had you had talked about your family also having the talk right about how to navigate public space. That you know all black families have to have this talk how to navigate um, this space, how to do it in a way that is uh, gonna save your life. And it doesn't actually matter, you know, what the, what the indignities are. Um, the, the fact is that you, you come out alive. Um, and so my question is, uh, one is the request of the parasol story. The other question is that you start us off with this really, really intimate um, story of your family right? We have pictures, we have photographs, we are drawn into um, almost a, a family history, a very, how one uh, family, um, you know, navigated this, this, this period of American history. And then by, you know, chapter two, we are in a full-blown uh, approach to writing Black women's history, which is not an additive, it is a history in its own. It is an, a history in its own um, in its own right, and so you know, Erica sort of ends where you know in Utah and in uh, Louisiana, this is not taught. But but you're very very adept at saying you know this is this is history that needs to be told. This is not history that's confined to one month in February, the shortest month. This is not, um, this, is, this is history that we need to know. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a question that I have, which is, was it really important for you to use your family's history as a way of thinking through this, um, what I would think is, it's not even an omission, but just a, a corrective to the way in which we're in which we're taught, and a way in which we approach the Nineteenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'll stop there. There was a lot there, but I still want to just make sure that we tell the parasol story. Because yeah, we, it, we 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 I, I promise, I promise. But there's so much. Thank you so much for those um, reflections and um, encouragements. Um, because I heard something in your in your remarks that I hadn't really thought about until just now. Um, because you're, you're right on point that once I begin this book, I realize I am not writing a history that is attempting to wedge black women into existing narratives or to chart their proximity to the figures of, of Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Carrie Chapman Catt or other suffragists at all, um, that in fact, um, what I think the history uh, shows is that black women had 
and have and continue to build their own autonomous, um, independent uh, political culture animated by a distinct set of values, principles, and visions um, that are just not reducible um, to uh, that kind of additive approach that would take, you know, insert them into a history dominated by white women. And it maybe it is not unconnected to my family in the sense that, um, you know, I am the descendant of enslaved women, but I'm also the descendant of activist black women who, um, who never um, presented or explained or positioned their work as somehow a rejoinder or an engagement or being shaped by what white women activists were doing, right? That, um, you know, up through the generation of my own parents, the folks in my family are the products and live in the context of enslavement. Um, and then in the context of Jim Crow with a brief respite in reconstruction, very brief. Um, and uh, their lives are in, doesn't mean they don't have relationships of all sorts with white Americans, but that is not how they are um, setting the course um, for their lives. And um, part of the kind of the reflection of this book is um, uh, or what the book allowed me to do was re to reflect upon, in a sense, how did that come to be so, right? And one of the answers is that running through American political culture, including American women's politics for too much of our history um, is a, an intimate engagement with anti-Black racism such that neither the women in my family nor thousands upon thousands of other black women are going to find an easy or a ready um, sisterhood or alliance or um, collaboration with white women. Um, white supremacy is just too um, consistent and visible a thread um, for um, the women in this book. And I think for the women in my family. Um, and at the same time, um, I learned something new, um, beginning in part with a story I unearthed about my own great grandmother, um, Fanny Williams, who was a young teacher in the 1880s in Paducah, Kentucky, um, after graduating from Berea College. Um, and it was a story that had never been told in my family. Um, so partly this book was, um, and that opening of the book is me um, realizing that um, I had not collected those stories. I had not asked those questions about the women in my own family. So I was gonna have to do what we do as historians, which is I'm gonna have to head to the archive and see what I can teach myself. Um, about the women who were so important to me, but are no longer here um, for me to ask them those questions. And I find my great grandmother in a the theater in Paducah, a young educator um, who has taken herself to the theater, um, sits in the seat of her choosing um, only to be challenged um, first by an usher and then by a constable and then physically um, oustered from the theater. Um, because she has stepped over the color line in there in Paducah. And that was important to me because it connects to the parasol story. So I am getting there um, because I understood the more I dug that this experience um, of not only being, you know, subjected to the color line, as if that was some sort of clean and neat organization of bodies, but that for so much of our history, black women are being um, confronted, denigrated, brutalized um, in the context of a night out at the theater um, or uh, a ride in a local streetcar um, or on 
um, a railroad uh, journey. Um, and that's important because then when you think about why it is that black and white women can't quite um, find common ground in political conventions, um, it's partly because their experience of getting to that convention is so very different and that black women are physically accosted um, regularly for much of US history and white women watch. Um, and that to me was a key to understanding how and why it was necessary for black women to build their own political culture. The parasol belonged to Ida, uh, excuse me, belonged to Mary Church Terrell, um, who among other things was the first president of the uh, National Association of Colored Women, um, founded in 1896. But as a girl, Terrell was traveling on a train. Um, the epitome of respectability, um, a privileged young woman of color traveling with her father, carrying a first class ticket, um, who when um, a brakeman attempts to physically um, remove her um, to the car set aside, a, a vastly inferior car set aside for black Americans, um, Terrell reaches for the parasol um, and she pummels um, the brakeman until the parasol breaks. And um, it is um, humorous on the one hand, and it is, it is as serious as a heart attack because Mary Church Terrell learns um, that the politics of respectability um, will never be enough. Um, and that women like her who aspire to political lives, to public lives, will have to learn how to protect themselves, defend themselves, physically um, in order to be a part of the order, ordinary rhythm of public life. And um, in that sense, your invocation of Sandra Bland, I think is not um, misplaced um, because Bland is someone who was there traveling in the ordinary course of her um, professional life. Um, and, um, and yet that kind of um, ordinary liberty um, continues, right, continues to be um, nothing less than a privilege for Black Americans, even in the 21st century, I think. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, I have several thoughts of that, that I'm thinking back to, there's a virtual reality experience that visited here in Utah. It's traveling around the country. It's called Traveling While Black. Um, mm -hmm. I commend it to people who may not have seen it. And actually another contributor to 400 Souls is a friend of mine, Deborah Douglas, um, who has a new book out, The Civil U.S. Civil Rights Trail, um, that may also talk about this challenge of journey, um, but extraordinarily insightful, the different experiences and how that may be coming together difficult. Um, I do wanna turn now to our audience questions that may be appearing in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to, oh, I think there is one, but it hasn't been transmitted to me yet. While that's happening, um, perhaps Professor McKinley would like to pose another question. Um, do people know that they can put um, the questions in the chat? Because I'm sure that there are others. I have one other question that I would love to be able to ask. It's a little bit of a geeky historical uh, historian question. Um, but I do remember when I was just starting out, you know, with my own uh, work, I was very rooted to microhistory and family history. Um, as a method to tell a broader story. And, um, and, and I was somewhat discouraged by senior people in the field, um, you know, as it, it, it wasn't important or it, it was just gonna tell a tiny story that wasn't, you know, the big story that, that if you really wanted to be a historian, you, you, you needed to tell. Um, I, I ignored that, but I also wondered, um, uh, in a question for you having finished Vanguard and, and really enjoying it, um, just thinking a lot of our work in FM history and diaspora history is, uh, is recovery. 
you know, and 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 how much of this is is recovery work? How much of this do you see yourself in that um, in that vein, or do you see that yourself in a in a kind of a um, a, a different vein? You know, um, public historian mm -hmm. writing for a broader audience. Um, uh, so, so that would be, that's kind of a geeky insider question. So I don't know if you have bigger questions, Erica, that you want to, um, um, actually now questions are pouring in. Um, about yeah. So I, I, I think what happened is that people didn't know that they could be in the chat. Right. So, um, this is something that we can, Martha and I can <laughs> sort of take up later, but, um, but I do know that there are historians in the audience and, 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 and history graduate students. And um, that would be uh, something that, you know, would merit even a, a brief uh, reflection. Well, I, I, if I could, I'll just say um, very briefly um, to our fellow geeks, um, you know, peruse the end notes to Vanguard when you have an opportunity because um, you can't understand the narrative I construct unless you appreciate that this book stands on the shoulders of three generations of black women's historians. Um, and so there is original research in this book and there is a great deal of synthesis and it is a tribute um, to our colleagues who have been doing this work um, with whom we've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and um, you might not gather that from the writing style um, but the footnotes are there to remind us um, the sources and from where this work comes. Wonderful. So we do have two audience questions. Um, sure. One is from a friend of Tanner Humanities and a community leader, Fraser Nelson. Thank you, Fraser, for being here. Fraser asks, what recommendations do you have for exploring our white family's history with regard to understanding our racism? And then um, I'll just add the second question as well. Um, Carrie Carlson, thank you for the question and for being here. Carrie would like to know, what are the current voting rights policies that we can reach out to state and federal legislature legislators to secure voting equity for all? Yeah, thank you for two great questions. Um, on family history, um, uh, you know, I am someone who is the keeper of the papers. So I'd say the first, one is figure out who in your family may be the keeper of the papers, of the, of the letters, of the photographs and those things, which are always a place to begin um, family history. Um, but I have also urged people, especially in the COVID pandemic conditions, um, nothing like the present um, for interviewing the elders in your family. Um, one of my laments in approaching this book is that the folks I most wanted to interview um, were gone um, and I couldn't interview them. Um, and so um, I would say, um, start with those elders in your midst and be sure that you've captured their stories, their perspectives, their experiences, um, because um, maybe no one has ever asked them about their connections to these facets of our history. Um, but one of the things that I think um, uh, Professor McKinley and I share is a sense that those stories that we might think to be family stories are really history, are, are the raw material of history. And so um, we value them as much in our own way as you value them. And I hope you'll have a chance to memorialize them. Um, the other question um, had to do with current voting rights policy. Um, and I, I do think about this too. And, and, um, and a, a magazine gave me a chance to, to write about this not so long ago. Um, and my observation was this, um, we still don't have at the federal level nor at the state level, um, by and large, there is no guarantee of the right to vote in the United States. Um, that constitutional amendments at the federal level are written in the negative. Um, they prohibit the states from doing things, but they don't impose upon the states an affirmative guarantee. And I don't know where you are, but where I live in Maryland, uh, my state lawmakers really pride themselves on not having um, uh, engaged in a uh, voter suppression legislation um, in recent years. We think of ourselves as a state where the right to vote is um, fairly um, straightforward to exercise. 
But we, in a Maryland state constitution, we do not have a guaranteed right to vote. And I think states that pride themselves on um, their liberal access to the ballot um, really should raise the bar in this country. And um, it is possible for the state of Oregon or the state of Utah, in fact, to um, amend their constitutions, to guarantee to every citizen the right to vote, to put the burden on the state so that we don't return to a time, right? as we've just experienced in the last election cycle, where the burden remains too often on citizens um, to uh, navigate and construct and to enact um, voting rights, um, rather than a burden on the state to um, guarantee to us um, that access to the ballot. And so um, while it is, um, uh, quite distant in many jurisdictions to be thinking about guaranteeing the right to vote when folks are battling against voter suppression um, a la Georgia. Um, on the other hand, in Maryland, I think we are overdue to guarantee every citizen of the state the right to vote and then make good on that. So wonderful. Thanks. I'm noticing it is 1259 now, just one o'clock. I understand you have a hard stop, Professor Jones. Yeah, I do, but it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> those who didn't get to ask questions, but thank you so very much for making the time to be with us. Um, again, please look for Martha, Professor Jones's book. Um, I think the answer to some of the questions may be contained in her popular public writings. So I commend you to look at those. There were some questions in the chat about um, Vice President Harris and the complicated legacy of policies and Professor Jones does grapple with complicated themes. So. Um, I apologize and commend that to you. Um, once again, thank you, Professor Jones. Thank you, Professor thank you. McKinley. Um, and thank you to our sponsors and partners who made today possible. Have a good afternoon.